As you remain standing, I would like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 23. Genesis chapter 23, as we continue uh, reflecting and meditating on the book of Genesis tonight, we will be on Genesis chapter 23, and I will read it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Sarah lived uh, 170, 27 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to, to, in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a, for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out, my dead out of the, on my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead, my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zophar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, Machpelah which he owns. It is at the end of the field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for, for a burying place. Now Ephraim was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me, I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephraim answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth four hundred shekels of silver. That is that, that, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephraim, and Abraham weighed out for Ephraim the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, for hundred shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over. So Abraham as to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. May the Lord bless the reading of his word into the hearts of each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, tonight as we meditate and reflect on this sensitive and difficult passage before us because it is about how your children should face 
death and sorrow in this life. And in many ways in our Christian life, we fail on how to face this difficult encounter, the enemies of the people of God that we call death. Even though it is a passage to eternity, to our eternal home, we all often struggle with how we face it and how we should react towards it. So we ask you to teach us tonight, to enable our hearts and our minds to contain your word in our hearts and apply them in our Christian life. Attend the preaching of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, I would like to start my preaching for tonight by asking you this question. And the question is, how often do you think about your own deaths? And I know the hearts of some of you might maybe be saying, what? Why? Why do I think about my own deaths? I have a lot of other things to think about and to worry about right now. I will think about my own deaths, my own dying or facing deaths when I see it coming. Well, the challenge that you have about that is death comes to us suddenly and unexpectedly. In fact, the two events in life that we cannot avoid and will come to us like a thief are the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and death. These two events in life are events that you cannot avoid in life. And the Bible, in regard to these events, especially concerning death, the Bible exhorts us, the Bible teaches us to die by faith, but also to be ready to face it by faith and with confidence in God's promise and faithfulness. And tonight, you see, the text before us teaches us that we all need to learn and need to be reminded from Abraham's life that our faith, the faith that God has given us by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, should go beyond the grave, should look beyond the grave. Our faith needs to have confidence and trust in the Lord beyond the life after. And that's what we learn from our next, uh, our text tonight. After his beloved wife Sarah died, Abraham faced the death of his loved one with faith that looked beyond the life after. And we will see that in three actions, if you will. Three actions that Abraham took in his life. The first one was Abraham's mourning or Abraham's weeping. And the second one was Abraham declaring his identity to the Hittites. He told them who he was on earth or in this world. And then thirdly, Abraham's awareness of life after death. Let me start with the first one, Abraham's mourning. In verse 1 and 2, especially uh, verse 2, Moses told, uh, told, uh, tells us, Sarah died at Kerit Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went 
and to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now many have understood and preached this chapter, Genesis 23, with the main theme of coping with the loss of a loved one and managing business dealings with people. And I want to tell you that's part of this chapter. And both, you see, coping with sorrow and grief over uh, the loss of your beloved, and then managing your dealings, business dealings with people, are very important in life. But they are not the central part or the central message or concern of this chapter. This chapter is, is not about how to cope grief with grief and how to manage uh, business dealings with people. The central uh, message of this chapter is how Christians should face death and sorrow with faith and confidence on the promises of God for the future. And what we have before us tonight is the death of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And the only woman in the Bible whose specific age at death was mentioned in the Bible was Sarah. Maybe some only the age of Sarah that was mentioned in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you how old Eve was when she died, how old Mary was when she died. The Bible tells us they died. But it, it was only Sarah's age that the Bible mentions. And then you see the reaction of her husband, our father Abraham, towards the death of his beloved wife. In addition to being the wife of the father of all believers, Abraham, remember Sarah was a godly woman whom the Bible presents her to all women, to all wives, as an example to be followed. 1 Peter 3, 6, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Sarah in the Bible has been presented to all women and wives to be followed. She was an example to all wives, a woman with quiet spirit, a woman with, with a gentle heart. The Apostle Paul used her as an example of God's free grace for salvation in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4. In Hebrews 11, she is, she is listed among the heroes of faith. She died by faith. And in relation to her husband Abraham, think about how this woman put up with Abraham. Two significant lies. You know, she act, he actually told his wife two times, Sarah, I'm afraid, I'm terrified. If these people find out that I am your husband, they are going to kill me. So I want you to lie. I want to tell them that you are my sister. Do you see Abraham telling to her husband, what? I thought I married to a hero, but you are a coward. Sarah never said that to Abraham. She did what Abraham wanted her to do. And when she died, you see, when she died, Abraham was completely broken. In verse 2, in verse 2, we uh, see him mourning, grieving over the death and the loss 
of his wife. And the lesson to all of us as Christians is, weeping over the, do- the death of a loved one is not unchristian. We should always remember that. Some people, they say, Christians should never cry over the loss of a loved one. Christians should never weep. But uh, when, they say, when they say that to you, remind them that even Christ wept over the death of his beloved friend Lazarus. The Bible tells us, and Jesus wept, knowing that he was going to raise him up from the dead, and yet Jesus wept because Jesus saw the consequence, the consequence of sin. What sin, what misery sin has brought to the world and to the people of God. And thinking about that, reflecting on that, Jesus couldn't help than weeping over the loss or the death of his friend Lazarus. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 tells us this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. The believer's death is like they, they go to sleep. That you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope, Paul said. You see what Paul is saying? Grieve, weep, mourn. But don't do that the same way that the unbelievers do it. Being without any hope in Christ, and in the life to come. Grieve, mourn, weep. That is normal. That's acceptable. It's not sinful. It's not uh, something that would displease God. Jesus himself wept. I don't think he was offending his father. It was normal. It was not uncommon or abnormal for Jesus and for us as believers to weep and mourn over the deaths of our beloved. This confirms to you two things. First, we all will die. All people will die, whether they are believers or not. We all will die. And then, it also confirms to you that it is okay for believers to mourn and weep over their loss. But as believers, as believers, David mourned over the loss of his own child. He wept. He mourned. You see him sitting on mourning over the loss of his child. But at the same time, He was doing what? He was worshiping God. He never blamed God for the death of his child. In fact, he went into the the, the sanctuary and worshiped God. And you see Abraham here mourning, but you don't see Abraham blaming God for his loss. But we see him mourning, but not uh, blaming God. The wise king in Ecclesiastes 3, 4 tells us this, a time to weep and a time to laugh. To everything, turn. There is time that we would need to weep and mourn over our loss. And there is a time that we need to laugh and rejoice. But notice what comes on verse 3. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, verse 3 shows you that the time of mourning for Abraham was over. With the Jews, seven days. He mourned seven days over the loss of his beloved wife. And then he moved on. He rose up. He rose up to do what? To become a testimony for God, for the love of God, for the covenant of grace. And we'll see how he did that. But verse 3 tells you that once our time of mourning and sorrow 
come to an end, we must move on. As believers, having faith and confidence on what is waiting for us. In the case of Abraham, I think Abraham knew two things. Abraham knew that Sarah was a believer. Abraham knew that there is life after death. That's why he got up and, and he uh, moved on. And that's a wonderful uh, demonstration of Abraham's faith. Faith beyond the grave. Faith beyond sorrow in this life. We have read in Hebrews 11, verse 9 to 16, 16 and you would remember what we read in our scripture reading. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but especially Abraham, live it on earth. They live it in a tent, but they live it on earth as what? As sojourners and foreigners and strangers in the land, in the land that God gave them as a promise. And the writer of the Hebrews tells us they were acting and they were living as if they were passing by. Job 121, naked I came, Job said, from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came to the world, and naked, and naked I returned to dust. And who should be praised for that? Not blamed for that, but praised for that. God, let God be praised for that. That's who I am, Job said. And Paul in 1 Timothy 6, 7 tells us this, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything from the world. My brothers and sisters in Christ, do you always remind yourself that there is nothing in this world that you will take with you to heaven? Absolutely nothing. Whatever you own, whatever you possess in this life, including your own children, when you die, you are not going to take anyone, you are not going to take anything that you possess in this life with you. You will go naked. Naked you came and naked you will go back to dust. Abraham believed in that. Not only believed in that, but he was convinced of that. He was convinced of that. And he comes to the Hittites. It's amazing. He comes to the Hittites. He got up and he, 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 he came to the Hittites and he tells them in verse 4, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me the property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead, my dead out of my sight. It was not, you see, Abraham came to the Hittites and he told them, would you uh, sell me a land? I want to purchase a land and build this uh, marvelous uh, house for my descendants. And then when I die, they will have a house. Well, Abraham said, I just want one thing. And I, 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 really, want, I, I really want this place. And it is a grave site. It's, it's, um, it's a plot for burying my dead. That's the only thing that you will own in this life. Your grave. Your grave sight. Job was right. Paul was right. But that was, you see, Abraham's testimony to the Hittites. It was no... Uh, no wonder why the Hittites called Abraham the prince of God. Because of his testimony. Because of how he was living on earth. Do you know, do you know what? Abraham never settled in this life. Never. He has no affection 
to land. He has no affection to any possession that this world would give. You will never find, if you go to Canaan, if you go to the promised land, you will never find any land or any city uh, that was called after Abraham, like Abraham's veil. You will not find that city. The only thing that you will find is this tomb. And this tomb in the cave. In the cave. In Mamre. And thirdly and lastly, his awareness of the life after death. Ask this question with me. Why do you think Abraham went all the way, extra mile, to secure a tomb for his wife and then for himself after and for his descendants after? And he bought this land by, with 400 shekels. That would be over 100,000 U.S. dollars. Remember King David bought a land for, uh, for the temple, to build the temple. And the cost was 50, 50 shekels. So the amount of money or shekels that Abraham paid for this tomb was overpriced over the amount that David uh, paid for the temple. And in Abraham's culture, you see, the normal thing that people would do was to take the body from another country. If, if, you're, if the member of your family dies in Canaan, and if you are a Jew, you go back to Canaan, and you bury your dead in your own land. You don't see Abraham considering that. Abraham is securing a tomb here to bury Sarah in Canaan. Not in uh, the Ur of the Chaldees, but in Canaan. And you need to ask why. Why is Abraham doing that? The reason why Abraham was doing that was because Abraham believed in the promise of God. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, God promised Abraham, Abraham, I will give you this land to you and to your descendants. Two promises, I will give you this land, I will give you offspring, I will give you children. He, he believed in the promise of God, but he also believed, you see, in what? In God's promise for the future. In God's promise for the future. It was because of his firm belief in the hope of a future kingdom that Abraham secured the tomb. Do you know, after Sarah, Abraham was buried in this tomb, in this cave. After Abraham, Isaac and Rebekah was buried in this tomb. After them, Jacob and Leah were buried in this tomb. Joseph, when he was about to die, he made his people to swear to him that they will carry his body to this tomb and he will be buried in this tomb. What's going on? What is this, what is, what is this thing with the patriarchs to be buried in this site, in this tomb? The reason was they all believed in the promise of God. Not only for the land, but also for the life after. They believed in that. And it's amazing, this chapter tells you that this tomb in the cave, in the cave, was filled with the the dead bodies of the faithful who have been buried in this tomb. The tomb in the cave of Mamre was full of the faithful who died by faith. The question is, was that the end of their life? Was that the end of their life?
what this man and woman who were buried in this tomb were waiting for? And the answer is no. The answer is no. You know, this tomb was filled with all these men and women who died by faith. But do you know, without the other tomb, without the other tomb, which was empty, the tomb of Christ, this men and women and all of us and all our beloved who died by faith, they would have died in vain. All these men and women, starting from Sarah, were waiting for the time and the day of their resurrection. The Bible says in John 14, 19, because he lives, we live. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he said, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by, man, by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, including all these men and women in this tomb. All of us will follow the firstborn, Christ, who defeated uh, the power of death and he was raised from the grave. We'll follow him. We'll be risen from the dead and we will live in heaven forever. That's your hope. Your final destiny is not this tomb. Your final destiny is not the land or the site where you will be buried. If that's the case, then Christ was not raised from the dead and we are still living in our sin and there is no hope for us. How do you apply these things in your Christian life? Let me ask you this. Is this your hope tonight? Is this your hope? Are you ready to face death by faith that looks beyond the grave? When you mourn as a believer over the loss of someone whom you love, do you mourn like Abraham? Do you mourn like Job? Do you mourn like Paul? As those with hope, as those with hope, which one dictates your life? Your faith in the promises of God for the future or your sorrow over, the, over your loss? You see, Abraham's life was dictated by his faith that was looking beyond the grave. My question to all of you tonight is, are you living as Abraham was living on earth? Do you consider yourself as a sojourner and foreigner? Sometimes I always wonder, you know, every time we greet one another, not all the time, but sometimes we need to greet one another saying, hello, sojourner. Alien, stranger, foreigner. We need to remind of that to one another all the time. And that's what, because that's what who we are. We are here for the time being. We are sojourners and strangers and aliens on earth. Our, this is not home. Our home is where our heavenly father is and where our savior is. So, dear friends, follow the example of Abraham and apply these things in your life by the grace of God. Mourn, but mourn with the faith that looks beyond.
the power of the grave. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, once again we give praise and adoration to your holy name for the reminder of your word to each and every one of us. We all fail in this area many times and often in our Christian life. We fear death. We lack faith and power at times to overcome the fear of death. And at times we sorrow, we grieve as those who are without hope. And tonight we ask you to enable us by your grace to continue reflecting on this, to continue applying these things in our Christian life. And depending on your grace and on the aid of your Holy Spirit, to live here on earth as sojourners, as strangers, as aliens. Reminding ourselves who we are here on earth, that we are here for the time being, and this is not home for us as your children. Enable us by your grace to, to do all these things, to apply all these things in our life. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's all stand together.